The harvest season gathers everything planted and readies it for storage. A writer's harvest celebrates that the growth part is over and completes the last jobs that will prepare a book for publication. In writing, we work through seven stages, sketch, rough shape, draft, revise, enhance, proof, and edit. When we've completed these, we can publish without hesitation. The rough and the draft are the most brain-consuming. After we finish these stages, we may be happy to turn to the critical job of revision. Confused about revision? Maybe this episode will help. Welcome to The Right Focus. We cover productivity, process, craft, and tools. Our podcast episodes last as long as it takes to fix a quick dinner, drive a short commute, or take a brisk walk. All through the summer months, we focus on the craft of writing novels and novellas and epics, from beginning ideas to prepping for publication, week by week by week. This week, we have two C's and three D's as we start our revision process. First C, celebrate. Tell people that the draft is finished. If they want to read it, tell them to expect it soon. Treat yourself to a dinner at a fine restaurant. Completing the novel is the reason for the evening. Tell people. Second C. Consider the whole manuscript. Rapid read. The entire thing as a printout. Yes, I know we can read on the screen, but we need objective distance. That's D number one. Objective distance is provided by reading the manuscript from a sheet of paper. The tactile nature of the printed manuscript creates a different mindset. And you can always recycle these papers later. D2. Place sticky notes wherever the story drags as you rapidly read. Note any changes and additions. For example, as we read through the mentor stage, we may suddenly realize our protagonist played the guitar. Where else in the novel can we briefly mention that? That's what we would add to a sticky note. D3, other than these notes, don't touch the manuscript. A rapid read just reads and notes. Definitely put a sticky note anywhere info dump occurs. Info dump is the kiss of death, as are cliches. After a rapid read in one day, we can work on the manuscript. We need to, first, revise plot holes and character discrepancies. These are easy to spot. Things don't make logical sense. Next, tighten up our theme and tagline development. Touch back to the tagline or theme at least once per chapter. If the creative muse was functioning in the draft, we may have more than one occurrence in a chapter. That's okay. Hardest step is to look for places where the story events or character reactions are too predictable. How do we know these? Well, they're the storylines and behaviors on TV. Avoid those. How do we be unpredictable? Kate Wilhelm's Law for Originality will help there. The first thing we think of? Toss it. Most people will think of that idea, too. The second thing? Toss it, because many people will think of that. Only a few will think as far as a third thing. To be totally original? Toss that third idea and use the fourth. We want to be ahead of the reader at the key points of our story. That's the plot seven scenes. We want to be right with readers throughout most of the story. Use the levels of Kate Wilhelm's Law to achieve this. Then we go back and look for inconsistencies. The master book should help maintain the same eye colors and character names and locations. Harder to spot are inconsistencies with character reactions. When we create a certain behavior pattern for a character only to break that pattern, Readers will not be happy. Perhaps we need that reaction to occur. Does it have to come from that particular character? Would it be better as a reaction from a different point of view character? Which brings us to the viewpoint of each scene and sequel. Is the correct character narrating the scene? Would a different character allow more interesting motivations and opinions to be expressed? If a scene isn't working, character viewpoint may be the reason. Then we turn to pacing, yet again. Does the story have slowdowns because the pacing dragged? Or did the pacing speed through something we needed to spend more time on? As we consider adding, also consider subtracting. 
whatever is repeated more than three times, or what was overkill for description, or a scene you loved, but which really didn't develop the storyline. After revising, hand the manuscript to a brutally honest reader who will look for these same issues and place a sticky note every time they see something. Give this reader a clean manuscript, not one that's written all over. Pick someone who will return your manuscript quickly, so make them sit down and read it in one sitting. They'll hate you for that. Might make their critique more brutal. Isn't that a good thing? While the manuscript is away, look ahead to the next book. When the manuscript returns, correct, print a new copy, and get ready for after revision. What's after revision? Enhancements. When we're happy with our revision, when we have a manuscript we're proud of, time to enhance. To enhance something is intensify or increase the quality of something. In films, characters in certain locations often have musical motifs associated with them. We might want to associate a symbolic motif with our primaries. Do so also with chief locations. How do we pick a symbolic motif? Check out a list of common archetypes and symbols. Several different lists are available with an easy search. As we scan through those lists, keep characters and locations in mind. If a character is always reticent to speak up, associate that person with different kinds of walls. Their words could be blocked, like water building behind a dam, or their words could tumble out slowly, like rocks dislodged from a wall. For a location where trouble always occurs, associate it with a square cage that imprisons. For example, describe the bars of shadow created by the Venetian blinds when the sunlight pours in through the window. In my book, Key for Spies, I associated a crow with one of the antagonists. In every viewpoint seen for him, I referenced a crow, a black bird, black wings, a calling cry, or the like. I only mentioned this symbolic motif once per scene, related in his perspective. Look only at your descriptions, primary characters and locations. I might dip into a significant secondary character, but I wouldn't work deeper into the character list. Limit the use of this symbolic motif. Don't extend it or it can turn into a running joke. You may want to decide to do like one-fifth of the chapters in the book. After enhancing ideas, Consider enhancing at the sentence level. As we did with the motifs, we need to limit any sentence craft. We'll say that going in, and we'll say that again. While some metaphors and symbols might crop up on every page, limit the ones that are deliberately crafted to be added. Keep these to every fifth manuscript page, or even every tenth. Sentence craft is the use of the major types of figurative language and rhetorical devices. Figurative language includes similes, metaphors that are direct or implied, symbols, personification, apostrophe, hyperbole, and understatement. Rhetorical devices include such things as chiasmus and osesis. Most people are familiar with the common figures of speech. Only students who had great composition teachers will have heard of the rhetorical devices. In addition to descriptions, work sentence craft into dialogue. Here's an example of a simile. You know, Jackie, someone says, in that presentation, Mike was soaring like an eagle until Alice brought up his failure at plant 57. The use of crop up, as in metaphors and symbols that crop up on a page, is an implied metaphor. Finding examples of sentence craft is a simple matter of looking for rhetorical devices. Try rhetoric and style in the search box. Thought Co. and Sylvia Rhetorici have great sites. Thought Co. is more accessible for novices to sentence craft. Easily usable for the writer are these seven. Anaphora, antithesis, alliteration, polysyndeton, osesis, zugma, and chiasmus. I'll explain each one, then give a single example. Links to Thought Co. and Sylvia Rhetorici will be in the show notes. An anaphora is a repeated word or phrase in a series of phrases or sentences. Listen for the word this at the beginning of each phrase in Shakespeare's Richard II. This royal throne of kings, this sceptered isle, this earth of majesty, this seat of Mars, this other Eden, demi-paradise. Antithesis is the use of opposites. As an example, 
comes from Debbie Boone. It can't be wrong if it feels so right. Alliteration is similar sounds in a short space on stressed syllables. From Macbeth's famous speech by Shakespeare and used as the title of a book by Alastair MacLean, The Way to Dusty Death gives us the alliterative Ds. A polysyndeton is the use of more conjunctions in a series than is needed. Here's an example from Lord Jim by Joseph Conrad. Listen for the word and. It is acceptable to have no illusions and safe and profitable and dull. Ozesis is climactic ordering. We have three items in a row. The ozesis can ascend or descend, as in intensify or weaken. This example comes from the translation of Medea by Robinson Jeffers. It gives us an ascending list of methods to kill, grind, crush, burn. Zugma is a really strange word. It uses one verb for two objects. One object will be concrete and the other abstract. In the sentence, she lost her keys and her heart. Lost is our verb. Keys is our concrete noun. And heart is our abstract noun because it means love. Here's one from Alanis Morissette. You held your breath and the door for me. And this one comes from The Things They Carried by Tim O'Brien. He carried a strobe light and the responsibility for the lives of his men. Finally, we have chiasmus. It's my favorite. It's simply flipping words. The classic example comes from Shakespeare's Macbeth. Foul is fair and fair is foul. Words are repeated, but they're crossed over each other. This comes from Cormac McCarthy's The Road. You forget what you want to remember, and you remember what you want to forget. Lastly, in our harvest stage, we edit and correct our manuscript for the final time. A line edit will look for typographical errors. Start at the back of the book. Read each page backwards. Be careful. Take your time. Take breaks. Don't be distracted by other things. No one is 100% perfect. You may want to have another friend read behind you or hire a local English teacher and give them a nominal fee. Some people contract out this line editing, also called proofreading. You need someone with a massive vocabulary and better than usual punctuation skills. That's all. You can hire a local high school or community college English teacher for much less money than an official editor who advertises online. The local teacher may be less likely to ruin your writing as well. They won't touch your writing voice. An outside editor may. Whoever you contract with, tell them that all you need is basic grammar and typo errors. Please don't trust the computer grammar and spell checker. It will not catch everything. It lets vile tro, V-I-A-L, vile, vile tro pass when it should be vile tro, V-I-L-E, vile tro. Pro Writer Aid and Grammarly are apps you can use, but be certain to trust a real brain, not an artificial intelligence brain alone. Outside editing is hard for some. It's hard to release a manuscript to someone else. Has to be done, though. We're getting very close to publication, so it's coming. You have to let it go. In the acknowledgments page at the end of your manuscript, or sometimes at the very beginning, thank the friend who helps you now as well as the friend who gave you a brutal critique, and anyone else who has helped you. And that's it for the harvest stage. Harvesting takes me much more than one week. I have my revision rounds before I enter enhancements. I have my proofreading rounds before final corrections. Last of all, I print and proof one last time. We catch more on the written page than the electronic screen. Next week, we have the peas. Presents, promotions, publish, party. There's an Ozesis for you. It's the concluding episode in our summer series of Discovering Your Novel. We have two snippets for our inspiration this week. The first comes from the poet Edwin Arlington Robinson. This morning, I took the hyphen out of Hellhound, and this afternoon, I put it back. Our second comes from Vladimir Nabokov. I have often rewritten, often several times, every word I have ever published. 
my pencils. At last, they're erasers. Thanks for listening to The Right Focus, a podcast for writers at all levels, hosted by M.A. Lee, with the assistance of Remy Black and Edie Rooms from Writers, Inc. Books. All through the summer months, our focus is the craft of writing. We are discovering your novel, from beginning idea to prepping for publication. We'll work through the process stages of foundation to story, envisioning the story, analyzing story before, during, and after the draft, harvesting the story through revisions and enhancements, and prepping the story for publication. Many of these preps and guides are useful setups for the National Novel Writing Month in November. That's writing only, you know, no idea work. We can also use this information to solve issues with stories that we've abandoned. All those stories are crying in the wilderness. Time to rescue them with the right focus. Show notes for this and other episodes can be found at therightfocus.blogspot.com. Write to us at winkbooks at aol.com. Remember, whatever occurs, write on.